Oh, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to episode 599 of Flow Wrestling Radio Live. I'm your host, Christian Piles, joined by two industry leaders, but not Ben Funky Askren today. I'm joined by Stephen Kyle Brackey and David Bray. Bray coming at us from, you know, about 30 feet away in one of our, what we call whisper rooms. Um, Ben is being a coach, allegedly, and Mm -hmm. is traveling back today after coaching at a tournament in Tennessee. So no Ben Askren today, but you know what? We don't need him. We don't need him today, but please come back, Ben, because we we need you desperately. Um, (laughs) Huge, huge week of wrestling, and we tried to call in from our Mercedes sailboat. It did not work Mm -hmm. um, on the road. I guess we should say not surprisingly, but... You know, we wanted to try, so we got. I think I got the intro, yep. and then all cell service was lost somewhere in. I believe at that point we were in Kansas, mm-hmm. and um, you know, no shots fired at Kansas. Shots fired at us for thinking that maybe it would work. But uh, I assume the show went well the the rest of the time. But we haven't got to talk about so many things because listen, we had the Henry DeGlane. Uh, I say Henry, maybe it's Henri, but we're gonna say it Henry just. <laughs> It's, I, Henry. it's gonna make Bracky more comfortable, and that's mm-hmm. what I want to say. Uh, that was epic. We had a great weekend of college wrestling, and then we haven't even got to talk about the Burroughs Taylor match yet. And it was an incredible match, and what what a triumph that though we were able to get the match in right after the whole thing was in jeopardy. It was a good chance it 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 wasn't gonna happen. And after all the saga of will they, won't they, and then we finally get the agreement and they're going to wrestle and it's going to wrestle Saturday, and then it's off. And then, man, it was just so awesome to see the response of the the wrestlers that they were just down to do it. And David, I think he would have wrestled him in freaking anywhere. Um, and, and Jordan being flexible, obviously he's got to get his weight down. And, man, we did it Wednesday. The production team really stepped up. We had two maniacs driving a U-Haul 16 hours with the mats and the, all of the equipment and setting it up and tearing it down. And as soon as the event left, they had to drive back to uh, Austin 16 hours that night. And so it was just, I mean, obviously it's easy for us, the content and marketing team, to get fired up about an event. But to see the whole company kind of come together and rally around having this event, super, super proud. And it was Obviously, an awesome night of wrestling. And then the match was, I don't know. I think we had a couple different thoughts of what the match could look like. I think there was a scenario in our mind where David Taylor wins and maybe wins decidedly. It's like he's gotten so much better. He's bigger. He can really score. Burroughs' Bur- tank is not going to be a weapon used against him. So you could see that. And I think there was a scenario we could you could see Burroughs winning a close one. And then the... The 4-4 criteria win, I really, for David, I really didn't anticipate a win like that for David. But clearly, the first five minutes of the match, David was really Mm -hmm. the super, super offensive, right? He was taking the attacks. Burroughs was firing off his uh, righty single, but was not even getting close. And then, you know, like a minute to go, like a, a flip switched, and... Jordan starts getting in and starts actually really not even getting in that much. He got a couple easy step out points and then he was able to get to the legs and finish and man almost runs down David at the end. And really the the debate at the end of the match, which I thought was sort of funny, was I and I didn't even realize it was happening until kind of the next day. People were just waging war against criteria. People yeah. were just all of a sudden and it's like you look at some of these accounts that are going crazy. It's like, okay, well, this person, yeah, we get it. You don't like David Taylor. You didn't want to see him win. And now, because you don't like David Taylor, you're mad at the thing that you think made David Taylor win when everyone knows the rules of wrestling, right? And so I am I am a reformed um, convict, or uh, convict, not a reformed <laughs> convict. <laughs> Let's hope you get that presidential pardon. <laughs> I, I need the part. <laughs> what the heck? A reformed criteria <laughs> hater. And now I'm a criteria supporter. And I am not a convict. 
and <laughs> allegedly, <laughs> allegedly, I guess I do have I do have a number of traffic violations so that I have been rightfully convicted of, um, but no no felons as felonies as of yet. But I like criteria is the bottom line. I think it makes the matches way more exciting that there's someone always winning and there's someone always losing and there's always incentive to score. And I never thought I would say that, but the last couple of years, I really came around and I watch a lot of folk style wrestling and I see the, the you want to call them a chess matches. I see a lot of the guys staring at each other and not taking risks because they know they're not losing, right? Whereas in freestyle, that's not the case. So you you miss me with all the criteria hate i don't um i don't dislike it i think it's i think it's actually a good thing and now would sign me up for more david taylor and jordan burrows wrestling sure i would have loved to see yeah. that but in general i think the overall product it creates is is way more excitement so i thought it was funny that because listen I understand why people want to see Jordan Burroughs win matches. I understand why people want to see David Taylor win. But you, I don't I don't like the selective rage against a rule because the guy you wanted to win, and we know some of those accounts, you know you didn't want to see David Taylor win, and that's why you're now complaining about criteria. Just be honest with yourself. You didn't want David to win, and now you're mad at the rules. Well, the rules are the rules. David knew them. Jordan knew them. And... No excuses from uh, Jordan on, on his loss. Obviously, he, he took his loss with class. And uh, I don't think you can complain about the rules. Uh, and, yeah, I thought, hey, I thought well, it was a great night of wrestling. One thing that I was encouraged by in that criteria debate was a lot of people were saying, hey, I was watching this with somebody that doesn't watch a lot of wrestling, but they really wanted to watch this match because it's Jordan Burroughs, David Taylor. How do I explain to them – you know how this works and it's like well i mean you know how do you explain to anybody how a sport works the first time they watch it they have to watch yeah. it and then they'll get familiar with it but the good news i thought about the debate was it did really sound like a lot of people a lot of new people or, or people on the fringes of wrestling were being brought into the sport because of an event like this and and i think if you have a hard time explaining criteria to somebody that's because you don't like it that's because you don't you know you don't want to like justify the fact that the numbers are on the are the same at the end and who's winning. It's not that hard to to explain to somebody, right? It, it's not really that complicated of a concept once you just spend a few time or a few minutes watching with somebody. And, and so I think it's a good thing that the debate is happening, not because cr anything's wrong with criteria. In fact, I agree. I think criteria is great, but it did seem like th I mean, this was a match where so many eyes were on it that. I think it makes sense that the debate is happening if it's going to happen at all because it's such a high-profile match. And listen, if, if you think folk style is the example of a simplified rule set, I mean, there's no there, that's got more nuance, and it also has criteria as well. The tiebreaker scenario, how they that's a criteria point. That's a fake point that they just put on at the end. So if you thought, and this is what Spay always says, he's like, listen, if you think – if it would make you happy that at the end of the match they just threw up a point at the end, okay, because that's what folk style does with their tie breaking criteria, um, riding time too, and, and riding time as well. So I I think that I think it's fine, right? I think criteria works, and I think wrestling. To your point, David, there is so much nuance in wrestling. It's so it is difficult, right? It is difficult to explain. Folk style is difficult to explain freestyle. And I think it's, it's, it's always going to be a complication and an obstacle because like soccer, for the ba basic level, I can watch soccer and very much understand what's going on and the, the what's, you know, you kick the ball, you can't use your hands unless you're the goalie. Speaking of soccer, score. they have criteria. Um, That's true. Matches in tied. Like at World Cup, they go to penalty kicks to decide who's the winner, but the final score is like 1-1 one, one or 0-0, zero, zero, and then it just says like so-and-so won in PKs. Right. So they have criteria. Yeah, they have criteria too. But but like wrestling is just a very complex, nuanced sport. And if the idea is to dumb it down and dumb it down and, dumb it down and make it simple so that you can sit down and watch the sport the first time ever and understand everything, it we would have to be sumo. It's like you got to push the guy out or knock him down. Is that what we, I mean? That to me is the only way. So it's like, no, we're going to have a nuanced, complicated sport where 
There's a lot of different ways to score, and it's part of what actually makes wrestling the best sport. And that's kind of a an offshoot of the criteria debate in general. But just don't – I don't want to hear – or you miss me when you say, oh, it needs to be simplified for the new fans because, okay, get rid of criteria. Our sport is still super, super complicated and hard to understand and hard to sit down and, and figure out what's going on. Right. So I think it's, uh, yeah, I understand. I think the debate is fun and good. There's nothing wrong with talking about it and always looking to improve the sport. That's why I rant about the edge rules because they're terrible. They're terrible in folk style and freestyle. And I think they need to be changed because you need, you do need to know what is the right call on the edge of a mat and you don't know in folk style the rest don't know and you don't know in freestyle what you're going to get when they're grounded when they're not grounded when it's one when there's continuation on a takedown these are conversations that we're having after after almost every event and you know we're, we're going to have them again and shoot i don't know, maybe this is a great segue into the Henri de Glane, uh, which I will not call Henri de Glane. Yeah, don't him. do that. Yeah, Sorry. Thank you. That's going to trigger Bracky all day long. Uh, where Gilman, Thomas Gilman, was in the semis, and th- the match was over. He had it won. All he had to do was basically not do what he did. we got the clip. We've got the clip. Um, so while Tyler's pulling that up, just to give you the, the oh, background here. Um Gilman is up 6-4 against, what was his opponent's name? Uh, George, Georgian, guy, Georgian guy, I think. Uh, but anyways, he's up 6-4 and closing time, and he kind of sh- like he kind of goes face mush at the end and gets like real physical with him. And then on the, they get towards the edge, and the guy kind of like really quickly changes direction and scores. I think we've got the clip here now. Um, go ahead and play it, Tyler. So you see Gilman is hand fighting Miller's nine seconds left. The guy shoots and Gilman's just shoving him, shoving his face. And then boom, quickly, they go out of bounds. And it doesn't look like a takedown to me, right? It looks like a, a step out point. But if you can kind of go freeze frame right as soon as he shoves him towards the edge and then turns it, you can see that Gilman's knees are down right here. Yeah. Uh, the right knee down, and there's a point where the left knee is also down. Now, freestyle rules say he that guy um, is supposed to pass all the way behind. I don't think he passed all the way behind. But the bottom line is the reason they're in this scenario is because Gilman, he, I don't know. What's the point of the face shove here at the end of the match? Just don't do that, and you win. And instead, listen, as bad as the call was, the tactics from Gilman are worse. This is just, and and listen, it's easy for me to commentate from the cheap seats. I've never been in a match uh, of this magnitude anywhere close. But this is this is a a trend we've seen with Gilman, where his late match tactics, as amazing as a wrestler he is, it 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 raises some questions. This guy looked like he had the the world team all but locked up against Dayton Fix, and he did the one thing he said, don't just don't shoot. The only way Dayton is scoring on you is if you shoot. He shoots flat on his belly. Dayton, an amazing defensive and counter wrestler, counters and wins, and he makes a team, right? So I thought that the conversation, because the call was bad, just distracted from the broader point, which, listen, this is this is all practice up until trials, right? This is all leading up to trials in the Olympic Games. And at every tournament is just how... When we come away with that, how does this, what does this mean for Olympic trials, right? What does this mean? And I, I think it's, that's how I look at it. And the fact that he lost his match, that's not going to impact whether he makes a team. But his tactics are going to have a, a, a big impact on if he's able to do it. And conversely, you look at Nick Suriano, who is another guy with, we have so many questions about Nick because, one, if you don't know, Nick won this tournament, which had Thomas Gilman, Vito Arujao, and the only two guys to beat Zara Oguev in the last three years, right? Yeah. Who is, if you don't know, that's a Russian two-time world champion. He is the guy to beat at Rio, okay? He's going to be Russia's rep almost assured, or Rio, in Tokyo. <laughs> um, 
he is going to be the guy for Russia in in all likelihood, and he's going to be the favorite to win the Olympics. And Soriano won a field with both of those guys in it, and uh, as well as Gilman and Vito. So I think that that's important to note because with Nick, he's still very much a mystery, and I think that's part of the reason fifty seven is so widely discussed uh, among us. One, it's got some tremendous star power. You've got Gilman. You've got Spencer. You've got Dayton Fix. You've got Nick Suriano, right, um, among others. But the other reason this weight is so interesting is because two of the biggest stars are, in a way, unknown on the senior level at 57. Yeah. We've seen Spencer Lee. He entered senior nationals, and he looked – Incredible. He smashed a, a tough field with uh, he Soriano was in that field, but he lost to Vito. He dominated Vito. He dominated NATO. He dominated Darren Cruz. This is Spencer Lee I'm talking about. But we haven't seen him against Gilman or Dayton Fix, right? So there's a question like, okay, we know he's on the level, but is he way ahead of these guys? And then similarly with Soriano, we know he's really good. We know his defense is is ridiculous, and basically no one can take this guy down, but does he have the offense? And what we saw with this version of Nick Soriano, not only could guys not score on him, he gave up one point to a guy that scored 15 points on Vito Arrugio. Um So Nick looked fantastic defensively, and, and I think Nomad did a little b- breakdown of like how few guys have scored on, on uh, Nick Soriano and Freestyle, I think. Zach Sanders had one, and Gross had two on an exposure. But this guy is really, really tough to take down. And then, as you see, his offense is really emerging. And what makes Nick, I think, a threat to to make the team, and a threat maybe even in Tokyo if he could make the team, is not only are he, – he has a foreign type of feel in that he's not going to volume attack. But when he goes – he goes quickly, and he finishes really quickly and efficiently. He doesn't need some long, extended finish. He can attack and, and, and just put him down quickly. So uh, I think he's, he's a, absolutely announced himself as a real threat. Now, this was at 59 kilograms, not 57. That's notable, right? How is he going to look down at 57? Because senior nationals was at 57, and he didn't look the same. He didn't look like this. Now, is that improvement? Possibly. But you can also attribute some of it to, you know, an extra two kilograms and Nick Serrano is probably feeling a lot better. Um, curious you know, for, for your thoughts. I, I mean, I think I think another thing that you can't f- forget to factor in with Nick Serrano is we saw him at 57 last year. Uh, I mean, who was in his corner, right? Who, who Where was he training? Like, mm-hmm. he, he didn't have a permanent training location. He was spending some time at the NYC RTC. But but it wasn't like he was all the way plugged in somewhere. Now he's got Mark Perry in his corner. He's been in Arizona training with Perry and man, what a difference a year makes last year. It was, it was Perry and Gilman's corner, Perry mm-hmm. working with Spencer Lee at the Hawkeye wrestling club. And, and uh, you know, you, you wonder about that. Not only what, what difference Mark Perry is, is maybe helping Soriano to make, but how that factors into these other guys heads. Right. Um, you know, you see, the end of the tournament, the guy standing on the top of the podium is, is Suriano. And I don't know, you wonder what kind of conversations Suriano is having with people in his camp about the, that Mark Perry factor. And does that give him extra confidence? And does it just like Perry's an awesome coach. We've seen him develop a lot of guys. Like, so what kind of development is happening in that room? And, uh, and is that a difference maker? And and I I thought we were going to end up seeing that, Gilman Soriano match in the finals. And that was, I think, why the the tactical error was so frustrating to me was it was going to set up this final with Soriano and we were going to find out a whole lot. Now we have to wait for it, but we see who's on the top of the bracket and it's the guy with Perry in his corner. And I think that's that's interesting. Well, you say find out a lot. I think we did find out a lot. I mean, I, you you watched that and he he dominated a guy that say that Gilman shouldn't have won the match or Gilman should have won the match. I agree, but it was still a very competitive match that he wound up losing. And, and Soriano dominated that guy. 
and he dominated other guys as well. I mean, who was, did he have? A, yeah, Amir Slanov. I mean, he he destroyed him seven zero. Yeah, it's a guy that beat Agoyev. He beat him seven zero. Right. So seeing him do it against the international him, he guys, is, he beat him down. Yeah, Amir Slanov like just physically, he physically couldn't go with Suriano. It was it was one of those matches where it like it looks like guys from two different weight classes. It's just so so much more powerful, and you don't see it. That happened to Amir Aslanov. And I think with, with Suriano, his athleticism and speed is something that kind of gets left out of the conversation. But I think it's something that makes him so, so much more dangerous. Just how quick he is to the leg and how quick he's able to finish. That's a that's a big deal. And like these foreigners, I mean, we, we watch so much international wrestling, guys. And Americans can get in on these guys and then it, it's all kinds of problems, right? These guys are... They're kicking out and they're countering and they've got a thousand different little tricks where we're getting in. These guys are just going over when when Nick's getting in. So I think I think we're getting some um, solidification at 57. That could be maybe untrue, but I think right now the the list is is Spencer, Nick, and Dayton, and that's 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 kind of how I see it right now. Um, there's obviously guys like. Thomas and Seth Gross and maybe even Vito that are going to enter that conversation. But for me, it's those three. And those three have been linked for years. And they've been, it's just been like there's Team Dayton and there's Team Suriana and there's Team Spencer. And man, I just am really excited for those three guys to all enter the same tournament and see how it shakes out because I think it's going to be fantastic. It's the reason we've been talking about 57 since. Back in December of 2019 and before then, it's just it's those three guys. They just make things way more interesting. Going uh, really, back really to the point, uh, Seriano points you were talking about, in the three matches at the DeGlane, uh, he gave up two points, and they were shot clock points. And then Nomad said uh, the only offensive points he's given up in four senior-level matches is takedown by Sanders Rujo, exposure by Seth Gross, which remember he was in on that single late, just trying to like yeah. – run out the clock and Seth just kind of hip tipped him. Um and then a step out against Shelton Mack. If he if he wins that gross match, he probably I mean I don't think Tomasello was beating him in the finals. No, it's unlikely. I mean Seth destroyed Tomasello, right. he teched him. But yet, I mean that's is that uh you know that late exposure from Soriano was a tactical error mm-hmm. from from him. Right? So is that evolution now that he's not making those mistakes and he's not fit cuz Basically, we were in that kind of it was almost like the uh, the the Dayton Gilman boat, where it's like, don't shoot on Seth Gross. You got the lead late. He shot in, and Seth said, "Thank you very much," and mm-hmm. and took him over for two. And that was that match. But you know, it, that seems like an eternity ago now. And uh, Nick looked really good, and and it kind of spirals into the next thing, the NCA implications. So I'm curious. I, I watched that, and I was like, does this muddy the waters at all? in terms of their NCAA decision. And part of the reason I think that that Nick is reluctant to commit and say, I'm going to wrestle in NCAA, I'm not going to wrestle in NCAA, is, is look around the NCAA landscape, okay? Look at what just happened to uh, Arizona State was going to have a, a, a match. and it got, Penn State, they had to pause all team activities because of COVID-19, right? And who knows how long those guys are going to have to be out of the room, unable to train. The idea, Suriano is clearly on a roll right now. He is training well. This is the best we've ever seen him wrestle. We've never seen him wrestle this well, right? Would you want to jeopardize that knowing that in less than four months, you're going to try to make an Olympic team, which is, you know, a potential life-changing event. Are you going to roll the dice that the Rutgers room doesn't get contact traced and you're out of the room and unable, your training is disrupted for seven to 10 days. I mean, who knows what, I don't know what the I, big 10 changes the rules. So Ohio state can get into national championship games, but whatever the rule is, the, it's going to be bad. If your team gets hit with any sort of a COVID thing and you got to pause activities. And if you're Suriano, you're training at Sunkiss. You're training with Perry. You're not with the Arizona State team. You're just training in a very small bubble, and you're limiting your COVID risk of getting contact trace, of getting, you know, lumped in with the administration and all that bureaucracy, right? So he is kept safer, I guess you could say, from having his training disrupted by staying in Arizona State. 
uh, and I say Arizona State, but really it's it's Sunkiss Kids, right? And I think that's a big part of the equation. Why would you go to a Big Ten room when that could mean you're out? And and what's the probability that these teams go an entire season without some sort of disruption? It seems pretty small. Now we're getting close, and there's only you know what two months to go, but. All the, all the same, I can understand why that's a, a risk for Suryana that they may not be willing to take, especially you're wrestling this good right now. You look like you're on the short list to make the team. You really want to disrupt your training right now? I, yeah, I, I think that, um, I don't know, if you're if you're in his corner, or, or any of these athletes for that matter, like you, you got to be careful not to be crippled by that argument because – what a lot of these athletes need between now and the trials is at least one more competition and, and hopefully and probably one more international competition. But mm-hmm. the risk that's posed by international travel, I think, is is a greater, uh, you know, risk to potentially like slowing down your training. We were talking with Terry Steiner yesterday and he was saying that that he's talking with athletes like Helen Maroulis about getting another tournament in. And he's like he's telling him, yeah, that like that's great. Would love to have you for you to have one more opportunity. But just know if you mm-hmm. have a positive test when you're in wherever overseas, that means you're stuck not only quarantined in that country for 14 days, but quarantined in your hotel room. A lot of these countries, like that's the policy. You are in your room. You're not out and about. So I mean, that that to me is an even bigger threat than than potentially the threat of of being, um, you know, being in a room that's contact traced. So I don't know. I, I think. If you're thinking about you're trying to read Soriano's mind and trying to read the messages that that he's hearing, it's probably, you know, the risk of, of what could happen in a college room is, is definitely, I think, one factor. But the risk of anything, any kind of travel could shut him down for a long time. So I, I don't know. I, I hope he doesn't let that be the sole factor in determining what he what he decides to do. Yeah, I think I think the, the main thing is why not? You're, you're training so well. Things are going well. You're wrestling well. Yeah. Now you're yes. going to go to a different room, different coach. <laughs> um that that's just that's just a thing that's a factor right and it's funny because because at the at the beginning of the mm-hmm. before the tournament i thought if suriano comes out and wins and looks really great i would think he would be more likely to compete for ruckers but now like I, I feel the same way as you seeing him compete and how good he looked and and just also how being reminded of how narrow the margins are at that weight especially i'm like ah maybe maybe you just keep rolling with what's working yeah, exactly. I do know if, if Soriano goes, if he goes to NCA, it's going to be at 125, which is pretty, I mean, listen, oh and, and that kind of, wow, we're really segueing well here because we've been talking about 125 and when, you know, we took out Vito and Glory and we looked at the two through whatever, we're like, holy dude, anyone could make the finals. I mean, not anyone, but there's a long list of individuals that could make the finals. It might be anyone. And it might be anyone. <laughs> for all we know, Bracky's going to wrestle Spencer Lee in the NCAA finals. We just have to we have to prepare ourselves for that reality. It who, could happen. Who says no? Who says no? I I think I think Spencer would not say no to that match. So, <laughs> and and it kind of reared itself this weekend when you had Rayvon Foley go down to Pat McKee. Pat McKee, fine wrestler, very good, but uh, lost last week to Liam Cronin. Lost to, to Liam of Croton. And I think when you look at that, you're like, yeah, it just kind of cements the fact of what we've been saying. Like, anyone can make this. But if Soriano goes 25, just shut it down. Just Let's just skip to the finals. There's, barring uh, apocalyptic injury, th- those two would make the finals, right? It's, it would just be as close to a formality as you can get. Um, so uh, what a... What a uh, you know, Spencer wrestles Liam Cronin and just runs through him in a way that was, uh, I think Mike, Mike Riordan, he is, he is funny on Twitter. Coach Mike, you should follow him. He I said like Spencer's running through nationally ranked guys. Like it's, uh, a, an exhibition match at a JV, to, like, like a ringer at a JV tournament. Like he just made it look so easy. Liam Cronin's really good. He just beat Pat McKee who just beat the number two guy in the country. And that's just how much Spencer has separated himself from from the field. And I thought it was – if you watch the McKee-Foley match, it was a really exciting match. Um, both guys were getting in on each other's legs consistently, but at the end, McKee just had it 
sort of figured out. And Bracky, you mentioned these guys had some history going back to like their Fargo days. Oh yeah, I, it might even go farther back than that. I, I think Nomads tweeted Tulsa Nationals, and he literally might not be exaggerating. Uh, I know these two have hit a lot, and they're both guys that give up points. Yes, um, and are known for being in these high scoring wild matches. So. I mean, some wild's always going to happen when, when they meet. And um, I mean, M- Pat McKee was. Remember, he got hurt last year. He got mm-hmm. hurt in the Schroeder match, and then just was That's not the true. same the rest of the year. So this could be the the real McKee, right? Exactly. Um, real and, McCoy. I know. I was. Gonna, <laughs> I almost said it, but I didn't. Uh, so it's not shocking that he beat Brave on Foley by any stretch of the imagination. It just goes to show, like. What we thought about 125 is true. Yes, I agree with that. Yeah, and I'm, I mean, 125 too. Brody Teske. I was just about to gets say. A, you know, Alex Malikor, he's number. He's he's uh, like undefeated at this weight. Um, goes from unranked to beginning of the year. Now, what is he, Bracky? He's sixth? Yeah, something like that. Uh, yeah, sixth. He, yeah, and in, in this year where we're going to have very small sample size of these guys, there's going to be more knee jerk reactions. And of his four wins, um, two of them are ranked guys, one being Alex Mackle. And Mackle last year only lost to guys ranked ahead of him. Yes. Um, I think he had maybe had one loss to Schwarm, but they were right there within a few spots of each other the whole year. And then he beats Mackle. He beat Connor Brown. He beat Danny Vega, who was pre- who started the season ranked. Um, yeah, he's on a roll. Uh, I don't know what is the difference between you and I at Penn State, but he seems to have found his stride and, and got things clicking there. Yeah, I think with with Brody – um, you want to talk about gives up points. This guy's been an absolute barn burner. He can't give a point. 30, 30, I thought the first 45 seconds of the Vega match, I was like, Danny Vega is going to tech this dude. It was, it was horrible looking. And then he just like, he just goes, goes, goes. And he wins 13, 10 and he beats Connor Brown, 12, 10 sudden victory classic. But then it's like, okay, yeah, you win those kind of shootout kind of matches against shootout kind of guys like Vega and Brown. But Alex Mackle is a different beast. That guy is really, really solid. He's hard to score on. He's just like very, very good. And you think this is a guy that's going to give Brody some problems. So him beating, passing that test really does say a lot about where where Brody is. And I think Brody, you say, I don't think it's a Penn State, you and I thing personally. I think it's, when we watched Brody in high school, it was like, this is a guy that's going to need some time before he's going to make a difference. He's not a guy that's going to be like, going to come in true freshman and be excellent he's going to need a little bit of work but he's got this motor and he's got some really good skills and once it gets sharpened and honed he's going to get there right and so I think it was just a matter of just that forging process right and I think he'd have been good at at Penn State and obviously it's working at UNI and they're doing a great job and the development that goes on at UNI we've been talking about for years now and it's it's no surprise to see him um, succeed there. So if, if Teske ends up like just continuing on this trajectory and if Soriano comes back, how crazy would it be to see two former Penn state 125 pounders on the podium at a weight where they've struggled to see productivity since Nico? That'd be yeah. insane. It'd be insane. And then, yeah, it, 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 um, that is kind of crazy. And then the fact that like Spencer was like a lock to go to Penn state at the time is it's just like, they're, they're, they're just a little snake bit. You can't feel sorry for Penn State. I mean, they're so good at every oh, weight, no. but like, um, yeah, it is kind of crazy. It's yeah, you're, but like people say, oh, Penn State can't figure out 125. It's like no, they've they've been like as close as they could be to figuring it out. It just hasn't quite worked for whatever reason. But I, who knows? And, and obviously, Brody Teske still has a, a long gauntlet to run before he's on the podium. Right. Um. But but yeah, that is it's just it it is so bizarre it's just it's like uh i don't know it's a curse or something <laughs> they're not cursed um but 125 you know we'll see i mean they got robbie <laughs> howard i mean he is he's they're not re- trying to recruit lightweights remember <laughs> no that was that was nomad's quake take of the century <laughs> um and which you know um but they they got robbie howard i mean listen that kid's sure. re- he's really good um him and brody they had some wars back in the back in the day howard kept Teske off a of world team back mm. in 18, 17, one of those years. Uh, so, you know, he's going to be really good. I'm excited to watch him. And I guess there's not there's not much to say about Penn State other than, um, you know, 
They're going to be really good. We haven't got to see them yet. I don't know when we're going to see them wrestle because of, you know, they had to pause team activities for, for the time being. I don't know if that was related to the DT thing. You would have to probably assume, but also at the same time, David, anytime I see videos of him working out, he's at M2. Mm-hmm. Penn State yep. is able to train at Penn State, I'm certain, now. So I don't think it was probably I, – I don't know that we can – I don't know that we should assume it was related I, to the DT. I, I'd be pretty surprised if it's related because I can't see Penn State letting their guys go there. No. You want them to try to be in the campus bubble mm-hmm. um, and only be around their teammates – and, and people they may encounter on campus, but as few interactions as possible. And, and I don't know, it's tough when teams pause team activities because there's no set return date mm-hmm. um, or mandate. I don't know, it's just for individuals, and they must have had a number of individuals either testing positive at a rate that they thought would be best to uh, shut things down for a few. So it, it could be this week. I don't know. I don't know what their schedule looks like. I find a hard time believing that they'll wrestle this weekend. If... Yeah. Oh, I, yeah. I, I, I doubt that as well. So w- I kind of moved off the DeGlane, but I think we should circle back at least briefly uh, to talk about some of the other high points. Um, Dake won, looked great. He had an epic Dake spike. We got that. Uh, oh, we've got it. Oh, my gosh. This was one um, – where you you saw it coming, you saw the future. If you watched a lot of Kyle Dake, you knew he was in trouble right here. <laughs> it's like no, no, no. You need to go down. You need to. Okay, bye. Oh. He hit the rock bottom. <laughs> he hit the rock bottom. I mean, this that's uh, that's something you don't see too often. But you got to go. You got to know when you're beat. Right here, you got to go flat. Do not. Yeah, this is not going to work. This is not the guy to attempt such things. And you got spiked through the mat. Mm. And then. <laughs> I'm sure it's unrelated, but I would like to think that his finals opponent saw that and said, "Yeah, no, I'm cool with silver. <laughs> I'm cool with silver and no CTE. It's fine. I'm just gonna <laughs> a, just go ahead and keep it moving. <laughs> Enjoy." Yeah, France. that was a two two birds, one stone, Dake bomb right there. And Gaziev's legit. That guy yes. has he's he's junior world medalist. Um, he's been you know right there on the senior level, and and uh, this this is no. You know, this is no roofer out there getting bombed. This is like yeah. a legit, legit guy in the world. So, Dake is man. He's so powerful. It's crazy. He's he's ridiculous. Um, Kyle Snyder won. We were supposed to see him against Sharifov. Sharifov lost, but then won his next match, setting up a a Snyder Sharifov semi, and he he pieced out. He said no, thank you, Coward. Um, so that was incredibly disappointing. I'm sure Kyle was very disappointed. Because Sharifov beat him at Worlds, if you didn't know that. Sharifov is um, ageless, at least to this point. He is, he is yet to age. But he does have tournaments where he does not look good. This was one of them. And I'm sure Kyle wanted to get that one back, but he didn't get that opportunity. I would have loved to see. There's basically only a few guys in the world that can really give Kyle Snyder a true test. And Sharifov is obviously one of them. And we didn't get to see the match. But Sharifov is a guy with wins over. Kale Sanderson... Jaden Cox and Kyle <laughs> Snyder, which is Man. absolutely preposterous. Guy's an Olympic champion. Well, I mean, he's done it all. And he's, you know, he's still on the level. But he didn't want it. I think Snyder beats him soundly if they wrestle this weekend. But out of season and uh, Worlds, Sharifov are two different guys. Um, Gwiz lost uh, surprisingly in a weird one as well. Where I thought he had it won and was going to win, but he didn't. But 65 kilograms, Yanni, I feel like he's on another upswing, right? Like we had the, the 2019 US Open. He beats Molinero, J.O., and Zane. And it's like, boom, different Yanni. Dude's a beast. And he kind of like held, maybe like went down a little bit around senior nationals 2019 time. And then boom, you can tell he's made it he's made another jump he tech falls Kanchikashvili, who beat him at beat the streets he beats james green for the third dag on time uh which is this one was is, the most dominant too this was the most dominant and i think you're and this is on the heels of him tech falling anthony ashnall win yeah we all thought he was going to win that match but we did not see a 10-0 with mm-hmm. anthony ashnall never touching his legs i think that's one thing you're seeing with yanni's guys aren't getting in <laughs> as deep and he is getting in consistently and 
scoring and finishing and, and looking fantastic. And there were some weird calls in Kanchikish Philly match. I'm not going to pre- pretend that was – I understood all the – but the bottom line is, he was way better than Kinchikishvili that day. And he was going to win that match. You can change some calls. Yanni's still going to win. Well, you think about Yanni, and you think about him being in these these scramble positions. Both guys have a leg. Crazy. I mean, he's been, this last couple of events, he's been shooting from space. He's been getting to double legs. He's been getting guys off the mat. And it seems like he's adding a whole different skill set Imagine that combined with the elite scrambling he already has, the elite leg defense he already has, and now guys aren't even getting to the leg, and now he's yep. getting guys off the mat. I mean, it's it's it is a big evolution for for Yanni, I think for sure. And I wonder how big an impetus the Kinchikish really loss was because Kinche is one of those guys that can scramble just as well as Yanni. And and I, you know, I wonder if he's like, man, I got to develop a different set of weapons to take on these kinds of guys. And now he's got both, and and that's scary. I feel like Yanni is one of the biggest beneficiaries of the world getting paused for a year just like everything getting backed up a season because i'm not sure march yanni april yanni's getting it done uh in the trials right i think there were there were some health things going on and you know he was battling injury i I was talking even this fall i think it was a little bit before he got back full go and now he seems to be fully healthy. And that's always going to be a question with Yanni. Like, the skills are always going to be without question. But this is a guy who's had to battle some injuries throughout the years, right? Going back to his cadet and junior days. Uh, and then, you know, ter- tears his ACL. And then there's injuries beyond that. But when he's healthy and he's clearly improving, he's going to be a factor uh, at trials, obviously. But, man, this is a guy that looks like he could potentially end the drought of the drought of droughts. Our, our, uh, we have not meddled at world since 2006, Bill Zadick. He's now the coach. Um, so yeah, we'll see if he's able to do it, but I thought that was a, one of the biggest takeaways from the decline was how good Yanni looked. And I, I mean, he does look really, really good, but you know, who else has looked really good in this layoff is Zane Rutherford. Zane. I mean, his, his match with Bajrang was like, whoa, nobody separates themselves from Bajrang like that. And, and you know, Yanni and Zane obviously had the big dramatic clash in 2019. And it's like, all right, is that, are we on a collision course for those guys again? I mean, it kind of feels like it to me. It kind of feels like it to me as well. But Jordan Oliver looms, right? Yep. And man, freaking Joey McKenna's looked great the last couple outings. And I know it's, it's not against J.O., it's not against Zane or Yanni, but... Man, he destroyed Seth Gross, so I thought that would at least be a match. And then, um, who did he beat? Who did he beat? Nation. Oh, Nation. Yeah, that was not close. So you know, the, the, it's those four to me. But I do think it's Yanni and and Zane for the time being are are separated. And yeah, can't wait to see how it plays out. And, but yeah, Zane, Kozak just brought up a great point. We still got to qualify the weight too. That's it. I'm, I'm going to take the the Mike Zadek. We're, you need to be positive. We're going to qualify the weight. I remember when Mike was uh, – that was like one of the first questions he was asked after he made the team in, in 2008. Someone asked him, and like – I think it was Martin, actually. And Mike's like – Mike kind of gave it to him. But it was it was a great question. It was like the, a fair question, but he kind of went off a, a little bit. Like, we're going to qualify the weight. We're going to qualify it. Qualified it four years ago. Which was totally insane. Somehow, we we, <laughs> we didn't. We got Mel- we do- did. <laughs> we got meldoniumed in somehow, <laughs> somehow, some way, where Frank Molinero didn't qualify the weight, but then the guy that placed ahead of him tested positive for meldonium. But then they let that guy in anyways because I don't remember why. But they said that's cool. But we said Frank, they also let Frank in too. They said Frank, you're somehow. cool too, dude. Yeah. And then Frank got fifth, which was great, uh, but not a medal. So. I think we'll qualify the weight, uh, but 65 is a really deep weight international. We got to beat some good dudes. Uh, Wasn't that – was Destro Bats there this weekend? Talk, Wasn't he there? Don't talk about that guy. Yeah, James what? Green beat him up. James James Green got him back for Team USA. Oh, man. <sighs> but he really didn't. He really didn't, though. Destro Bats still has the last <laughs> laugh. <laughs> he has the last laugh. He, listen, Destro Bats has booked travel to Tokyo, and we can't here in the United States of America. Son of a – Say it. Desterbats is the master. <laughs> Desterbats is the master of 
getting absolutely worked and then winning somehow anyway like his at the world cup he just did that like every match he would he would get in a giant hole and then somehow come back and win or, or sometimes it wasn't always a giant hole but he was losing like every match and he and he came back i think he was bronze at the at the world cup the individual world cup so if that guy you know he has a history of doing it but i think the problem is he he had a couple of training sessions with JD Raider maybe in the last year and a half and uh, is that I right? That, I think that might be yeah JD Raider and the the Carney team went over somewhere there was some camp and there was a team from Argentina and I think JD might have might have given so JD helped couple, helped uh, him beat Zane the, the enemy yes that's not good can we fire him we can look into it. Talk to um, HR after this show. Let's get HR on the, on the <laughs> this, this will, well, Maybe this will be the first uh, FRL with some HR involvement. Finally. Uh, other note, Tamara Metzestock, Force Molinari, wrestled. Uh, it was a close first period. Tamara mm-hmm. pulled, pulled away at the end. I think after you watch her beat Adeline Gray, you feel um, like she's a pretty substantial favorite. We knew that kind of going in. But, man, if you're Forrest, just like, man, you're in the match in the second period. You got to – you got to get to attacks and, and finish. Tamara, when she went, she scored. Uh, but that's that's going to be the trials final. You have to figure. And uh, it'll be a good one, but I think it's it's tough to pick against Tamara. She's on that pound-for-pound pound tier internationally for, for women's wrestling. So uh, any yeah, other takeaways? Wait, I mean, it's just it was the exact match that you thought it would be. You thought, you know, Forrest is going to make it an Iowa-style hand fight, and she did. There, there are I don't I don't know that there are any women at 68. I don't know if there are any women in the world that hand fight the way that Forrest does, and and that's a something that can take a lot of people out of their element if you haven't experienced it. And and I think that's what happened in the first period. I think she was able to take Tamira out of her element. I mean, you talk about Tamira just beat Adeline, but Adeline doesn't wrestle that kind of a hand fight. No. Her her threat is more if she transitions to lace, then she could end it. But. Um, but Forrest, she brought, she, you know, really frustrated Tamira. And it was a question of, okay, can Tamira overcome this physicality? And, and she did. Uh, so Forrest has to, like you said, shore up the attacks, figure out how she's going to get to Tamira's legs. But that, it will be that physical again. She'll try to get in Tamira's head anytime they wrestle in the future. And so it's always going to be at least a very intriguing match. Tamira's going to be the favorite, though. Yep. No, no doubt about it. Now, I can't believe we've gone almost an hour here. We haven't talked about the Iowa-Nebraska duel, which was a, frankly, total beatdown. I mean, Nebraska's ranked number six. Their lineup is ridiculous. They have a really, really good team. And Iowa uh, took basically no prisoners. Of note, Michael Kimmer didn't wrestle. He's fine. Uh, Sounds like he will wrestle this weekend against Minnesota. Um but maybe that was just – maybe first match back was too big of a test with, with Labriola. And, and Kimmer's a guy with – who's had injury issues in the past. I think you just want to get this guy to Big Tens and NCAA is healthy because he's a he's a, clearly a national championship contender and probably favorite What would you right think now. of Kennedy? I actually thought Kennedy looked really good. I thought it was one of those – you know, Labriola's got some – some stuff he can do. He's a really good, really good at counters. He's got good offense. I thought Labriola looked fine, but I felt like, man, first match out, that's your test. And Labriola, I thought he looked great. He can really hand fight. I thought he was really uh, impactful with his with his clubs and moving Labriola. So while he's not as good as Mike Labriola right now, if you're a Hawkeye fan, you've you've got to be excited about Patrick Kennedy because I think he's going to be a a vintage iowa style wrestler and i think he's gonna be really really good what'd you think though no i I came with the same same takeaways he's gonna be legit i'd be interesting to see if he what other kind of matches he gets this year you know i know they're doing a lot of extra matches but Mm -hmm. maybe if if kimmer is like kind of on a pitch count he gets to see some of the top tier guys and that'd be even better for him um but yeah and I think he's a 74, like I've been trying to tell y'all. He's thick. Because Labriola his... is one of the biggest 74-pounders yes. in the country, and he did not look like he was a different weight class than him. He did not. Uh, I thought I thought it was it was a match where I think the, the score was, I forget the final, it was a little more lopsided than maybe it was in real life. I thought there were a couple of turning point exchanges when Kennedy got in where if he finishes, it's a completely different match. 
um, and I'm, I'm forgetting the score seven now. four seven four right so there's like four, I mean yeah it was five four at one point in the third period right yes so I th- I thought he looked um thought he looked good man I'm a, I'm it's 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 a cool thing about this no eligibility uh, consideration for the year we get to see these true freshmen we wouldn't otherwise see they would never wrestle him it, otherwise it takes me off you know they when football came out with this rule that you could play in four games and not lose your red shirt. They said that they were going to apply it to every other sport, and it's been like four years now. It's not hard to apply to every other sport. No. Even if it was just four duels, but, I mean, it should be. Like, football, that's like 25% of the should season. 25% right, of the season. Right, I agree. Even if it was just four duels, I'd be happy with that because that would help avoid forfeits. It would yes. give these guys some, you know, like Gable, I recommend it. You yeah. get in the singlet yeah. and you step out there, you make weight and you wrestle. Uh, I don't know what – I don't know what – and That's I don't know different. why all these other coaches in the sports aren't fighting for it more. You know, it, f- it feels like it's kind of just gone by the wayside. Yeah, I, I think it needs to happen. Um, hopefully it does. But the biggest takeaway, we already talked about Spencer just running over Liam Corden. It was interesting to see him really work for the fall because a, a critique, I love the critiques of Spencer Lee. They're like, well, he texts people and doesn't pin them. Or like <laughs> he scored he scored 13 points in the first period and only scored two in the second. Um, there's not many. There's nothing but nits to pick. But he was a guy. He's like it was so methodical for him to just get the reinforced bar tilt and turn him over three or four times in the matches over. That it's like well, that, but now seeing him work for the fall. I know it's just one match, but double arm bars brutal. Got the got the pin, no problem. Uh, that's notable. But really the biggest takeaway of that entire duel was Nelson Brands. It's mm-hmm. like, listen, that, that was just a beatdown start to finish. And I don't know if Nelson Brands is a full-size 84 or not. I thought he looked fine. I he looked he, bigger than last he year. Looked, he looked bigger than last year. Yeah. He looks big enough, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. He looks – I mean, and the thing is, some of the ways he was scoring defensively – the power he must have in his hips and his legs, popping guys off, popping Vins off, and, and running around, is s- says all you need to know about where he's at. He he straight up broke Taylor Vins, who we all regard as a legit top five or six guy at this weight class. Had a really good weight class, and he had no problems. Vins was really not that close. Now it's Vins's first match. Vins is a guy with some variance in his performances, right? You'll see good Vins and not as good Vins, right? But the 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 high end Vins is is the high end Vins beats Aaron Brooks. Right. This guy's like he beat Aaron Brooks. So I I think I just tend to err on the side of Nelson Brands is really good. We've been seeing signals that Nelson Brands is on a, an incredible ascent. He destroyed A Basad, right, in the showdown. And then he had a really strong showing at U23s, losing only to McFadden, who is absolutely really, really good as well. So I I think it's like, one, it's very obvious he's going to be the guy for them moving forward, provided he's not injured. Uh, I, I can't see Assad coming out and, and replacing him. And two, I think he looks like a top five-ish guy to me. I don't think he – I don't think – He's on the Brooks Hydley tier. I will have to, I'll have to see that to believe it, to believe he's there. But uh, against a, a Bolin, he may be in that match. Against uh, um, you know some of these other guys at eighty four, maybe he's in that match. Maybe he's in the match with Brooks. I'm just not ready to go there yet. Yeah, you think about him. At first, I was like, oh, okay. When, when he comes out, I'm like, oh, we're going to have the same story we had last year where it's this lineup battle between Br- uh, Brands and Assad. But, like, last year he, he had took his opportunity to beat Matthew Waddell, who I think was ranked around 18, 19, 20, somewhere in there, and it was a, a relatively close match. He controlled win, but it wasn't a major or anything. And then he had, like, this razor-thin match with Sammy Colbre, who mm-hmm. was kind of ranked, like, really high, but in a, in a weight where it was like, okay, maybe he should be at ranked that high, maybe not. And it was like an overtime match. This is so different. This is not the same situation as last year. He's evolved a ton. And, um, in a year where Iowa was the favorite and Penn state is chasing, it's like, Iowa just added a huge amount of potential points by that performance by Nelson brands. I got to say, I don't like where he's ranked right now. Okay. You're... I think he should be higher. 
You realize he lost to Braun Angle last year? Yeah. Okay. Well, he's but, but Rocky, Chris Weiler. I mean, Weiler. Weiler just beat Braun Angle this weekend. So why is he behind him? Because he also lost to Rocky Jordan. <laughs> he's, he's <laughs> it was, it was, so Braun Angle beat Jordan. Weiler beat Braun Angle, but Jordan beat Weiler. And Braun Angle has a win over Nelson Brands last year. Man, I feel like, but but he beat Taylor Vins. That's a better win than all these guys have, right? Uh, Dude. not Braun Angle. Braun Angle has a win over Cam Caffey as well last year. Um, see. Cam Caffey's a better win than Taylor Vins. I think that's questionable. Big, big Ten finalist Cam big Caffey. 10 finalist. I mean, he he pulled away they, from Taylor Vins last year. Taylor Vins beat Aaron Brooks last year. Right, and then after that, he also lost to Ava Saad. I'm going to pull up his wrestle stat. Those two were going in complete opposite directions at the end of last year. He beat Assad at Big Tens and Rocky Jordan at Big Tens. He only lost to his only loss at Big Tens was to the Big Ten champ Aaron Brooks. They lost to Cam Caffey eleven to six. Where? In the duel. In the duel. January twenty sixth. Yeah, I don't know. And then Cam Caffey made the finals. I think you've got a. I I would have overreacted to the Nelson win. But that is uh, admittedly an overreaction. You might have been able to overreact to it if he did not have um, a resume at 184 last year. You see what I'm saying? Like he lost. If he didn't have a loss to Braun Angle, he probably goes ahead of him. But I feel like he was pretty dang good at 84 last year. Um, his losses he lost were he did lose to he, he lost to Cash Wilkie. I forgot the Wilkie loss. Yeah. All right. Fine. Forget he lost that. to Travis Stefanik. Yep. Whatever. <laughs> That's Listen. what I'm saying. Like, if he had wrestled, uh, I don't know, 74 last year, you know, and not had this resume at 84, he probably would just jump way up there. Lost to Montalvo. All right, fine. This is – but I'm still calling shenanigans. <laughs> still calling shenanigans. Uh, oh, man. This is this is like when Ben just uh, biasly argues for his Missouri Tigers. Speaking of, we are just – That's a transition right there. Segwaying sons of guns uh, today – uh, Missouri is just kicking people's necks in. They're kicking They're, people's necks in. They also they have wrestled like by far the most duels in the country. There are like seven duels already. Most yeah. there's teams that Pitt State has wrestled. Yeah. Like, there's a number of teams. Stanford, that have, Stanford doesn't have, have a schedule. schedule. Wow, classic change. <laughs> they put out. They put out last night. They're going to have a schedule. They're cleared to compete. Uh, but I mean, Drexel. I was looking at them. They don't have a schedule. American. I don't. I don't know what's going on with those teams. Um, I was wrestling hey, one on. duel. Sidebar: How about Stanford's coaches getting kicked out of their social media accounts? What? Did that you see B- that? Yeah, I saw that. That was BS. Stan- I don't know anything Stanford, about Stanford. Stanford athletic department wants the coaches to to like stop trying to save the program. They want them to basically <laughs> say we support like you know our athletic department, and so they took away their access, like their their passwords to their social media accounts. So now, like, to their all personal Stanford ones. Food, no, 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 to the Stanford Wrestling Twitter accounts. Oh, my and so, gosh. And so social media accounts. Yeah. So, so now if you want info on Stanford Wrestling, you have to follow the Save Stanford Wrestling Twitter account. That's where they're posting everything because they're locked out because the athletic department wants them to say, hey, we don't care that you raised all these millions of dollars to save the program. Uh, we want you to support us in our horrible decision to end wrestling at Stanford despite the actual work that you've done to bring it back. So uh, they're locked out. So a bunch of yeah, uh, save Stanford or keep Stanford wrestling, I should say. Uh, put out the statement said just prior to its July eighth announcement, the Stanford Athletics Administration locked our coaches out of all at card wrestling social media accounts. Two weeks later, the admin contacted the coaches about regaining access to these accounts under the condition that all future messaging remain constructive toward the department's decision. The coaches were encouraged to draft and publish a statement regarding the painful news, then turning the page to the upcoming year of competition. The coach said, in that case, we have no need or desire to resume using those platforms until after the wrestling program is restored. Uh, we respectfully but vehemently disagree with the department's decision and how it was handled, they explained. So any messaging to the contrary would be an inaccurate representation of us, our student-athletes, alumni, and supporters. Heck yeah. Don't, don't, don't bow down. Listen, I, yeah, I, Town, I disrespectfully dad, disagree. Yeah. You Gabe Townsend's dad said they don't, they don't negotiate with terrorists. 
<laughs> That's right. I mean, yeah. I mean, what? Yeah, silencing dissenters. It's a fun, fun thing to do. Um, I although to be fair, if you're gonna do it from the school, you can't be getting like, <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah, I sort of understand that. But at the same time, you're you're just embarrassed because you're making terrible decisions, uh, Stanford. So that Missouri. That, yeah, dang it! I'm trying to talk, I'm trying Sorry. to give Missouri. I want to give Missouri love today before Ben's on, because he will just be. Absolute, he'll be so annoying. He'll be untakeable. Here's what he'll do: he'll just complain that they're not high enough. Oh yeah, he's and gonna crush you before before he, he even gets on that. here and says this. Get out in front of it. Yes, I'm going to get out in front of it. I think Missouri is gonna compete for a team trophy this year. I do. Like too. they are that freaking good, and. We talked about it two weeks ago, and we were like, they have this amazing upside. And you saw it this week. They go from 17th in the team tournament to 11th, and they're not even close to their potential. Um, Alan Hart, for the third consecutive week, moves up big time. He beats Ian Parker, so he's number four now. He's undefeated on the year, and his he has to have the best resume of anyone this year. Um He's beaten number five Parker, number twelve Dresden Simon, number eighteen Grant Wilts, and number two Clay, uh, Clay Carlson, twenty-two. Uh, he's on fire. Rocky Elam gets uh, breaks in the rankings. I think he's going to climb higher. Uh, What's he at right now? He's like twenty-two, I think. Twenty-two. He's going to be a top eight guy. Yeah, he missed that first weekend where I think he could have gotten Tanner Sloan. Um, he's twenty-three right now. He beat. Landon Pelham last weekend, who then this weekend beat Gage Braun, who was in the rankings, so that pulled him in. Um, Keegan O'Toole, uh, Peyton Mako jumped five spots. He beat, um, I'm blanking on who he beat right now, um, but he beat them. Um, and then uh, Keegan O'Toole is like the first person ready to jump in, and he'll actually have two ranked matches this week with Colt Yinger and uh Olenek from northern illinois so i mean check out our boy check out uh the the hit list here it's not much of a hit list but he is racking up serious points keegan o'toole fall tech 12-6 decision over cole moody tech tech fall um the he's gonna be wow. super legit this year i can't wait to see him at 65 57 doesn't matter he's he's really really good i can't it's going to be unfortunate because we're not going to really see him against super, super elite guys until Whitlake at the yeah, end of the I year. Think February 14th, he'll see, he'll see Whitlake. Valentine's Day. No love loss there. Wow. wow. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> um, so, I, I mean, Missouri is a really, really dangerous team this year. And we haven't even talked about Brock Mahler, um, who's absolutely having a great year. And, you know, it's interesting because – Josh Edmond, I think he had a great juniors or U twenty threes. We're like, oh, this dude, he's he's definitely yeah. gonna be the starter for Missouri. Uh, no says yeah. Alan Hart. I have no interest in being your backup. I'm better than you, and I did not see that coming. I was like, yeah, Edmond will be the guy. Yeah, I didn't either. And then in the wrestle off, it was like sudden victory, and then um, the first weekend they both wrestled. But Hart has just taken advantage, and I mean, I don't know how you could wrestle Edmund at this point when you got Hart beating Ian Parker. Yeah, Parker, Big Twelve champ, lots of good wins. So and yeah, man, he was on a ten match win streak Patrick. dating back to last year. He has wins over guys like Cade Brock. Ian Parker's awesome. Yeah, in look great at U twenty threes as well, beating Mitch McKee, I believe. So yeah, um, Alan t- Hart, Tiger style. handsome fella too. Oh That's yeah, you look the ginger ginger <laughs> unity there with uh Bray and uh Bray and Oh, does Hart. he have red hair? I I didn't even you, notice. I just thought he was a handsome looking guy. <laughs> I'm sure that was it. They even they even moved up with uh Schmidt falling like four or five spots. Yeah. Like, that's that's hard to do. And Elam fell a couple spots, so that's impressive. You you mentioned um Sloan, you know, he uh Elam would have had an opportunity against him. I don't know how Tanner Sloan is destroying people. He is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and zero. Oh. Fall Tech, fourteen one major. Fall Tech, Tech, Tech. So, in in at one ninety seven, we we've talked about how interesting this weight class is. I I am curious where Tanner Sloan fits in here. Um, he's obviously ranked pretty high, but yeah, I think he's tenth right now. Um, 
he's Big 12 runner up last year. Let's see, probably his, he'll see, no, that got canceled. See Traxler potentially uh, in two weeks. He got a Woodley. Um, looks mm. like they don't duel West Virginia, so we won't see Adams match up till Big 12s. But yeah, absolutely. He, he's looked awesome this year. So that, I mean, that's pretty incredible bonus right there. Yeah, it hasn't been against the most exemplary competition, but it's division. It's Division One wrestling. It's Division One football, <laughs> and uh, for that reason, you can't be anything but excited. Go play intramurals, brother. It's one of fa- Bracky's favorite bits. <laughs> um, man, I feel like we didn't get into the entirety of the uh, Iowa duel. Um, trying to think of some other odds and ends. Alex Thompson, it's going to be tough for him at thirty-three. I can't believe Ridge Lovett outgrew that weight. I mean, think how much better Nebraska would be if they could somehow slide him in there, but. He was a true freshman last year at 33. He certainly looked on the bigger side at that weight class. And, you know, if you're too big, you're too big. But it is unfortunate because he would just make their team that much better. Schultz once again beats uh, Jacob Warner. Um, we had it. We had that ranked appropriately. But yep. the others apparently were reluctant they to do They just ignored so. results. They just ignored results, but we did not. Uh, Cassiope looked good. Hold on. Um, Wait. You know how, well, no, he did but you know how you talk about uh, Seriano gave one point to the guy that uh, Vito gave up like 15 to? Yes. Uh, Anthony Cassiope scores one takedown on Christian Lance, the guy who gave us Houston Tech fall, only scoring takedowns. Yes, that's Ooh. crazy. And you talk about insane uh, bonus rate. I know Gables only wrestled three matches, but he had like a 15-second pin this weekend <laughs> and then another Tech fall. <laughs> so. Gable, it could be like bookends Hodge watch Gable versus. Except, see, here's the thing. Gable's gonna have. I he's not gonna be able to keep. Gable's got a tougher weight. Does that factor? What if he bonuses everyone except like Paris and Kirk, but wins NCAA's? It'll be interesting. Now that what could help Spencer is if Suriano comes back and he yes. beats him, right? Um, or or if Spencer has a hundred percent bonus rate, that versus. Gable winning a tougher weight. That could be a really interesting dynamic. I'm, I'm looking at Gable's wrestle set right now. He scored 23 points on Brad Wilton in three minutes and 10 seconds. That is Austin DeSanto pace. That's 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 a DeSanto pace. <laughs> Gable Steves in wrestling Austin DeSanto pace is the scariest <laughs> thought anyone's ever had uh, about a wrestler. So, oh, th- there's a little Twitter Twitter fun because. There was a, a Michigan tweet, I think, about Mason Paris where he said something like, as soon as I wrestled Gable at Big Tens, I knew I could beat him. And then Gable quote tweets, I think we can probably have Tyler pull it up. Um, Bracky's looking for it right now. Gable quote tweets, it was just a simple LOL, which <laughs> I thought was funny. Yeah, uh, he deleted it. Oh, He does good. that. Oh, he does kind of delete tweets sometimes. <clears throat> but it's, it, it's ironic because Gable didn't wrestle Mason at, uh, RTC Cup. That match could happen, but it was Tony Nelson that went out there, not Gable. So we could have learned. I mean, that was a match I really wanted to see. And Mason is clearly on the level. Is he going to beat Gable? I'm not going there yet. I'm still Gable, Gable, Gable. But Mason's going to be a there. great matchup for him. I think it's not a great matchup for him, but you just can't deny no, the, pro- the insane not. progression he's making. And then Kirkfleet looms as well. He's his total wild card in this, mm-hmm. in this factor. But Gable seems to be, whereas I think we'd see him just like settle for like, you know, a dominant 14 2 major. He really is separating himself um, in a way maybe we haven't, haven't seen no, before. No, we, we have not. I mean, we saw it against like guys that were two, three levels below him. But the fact that he's like pushing himself to get the tech fall against Christian Lance when he didn't need to yeah. for anything, like. Just to do it. Yeah. Uh, other notable D1 action, Andrew Bubba Sparks. He has been kind of a story here. A, a big, big weekend for the Ginger uh, family. Maybe I should let you take this segment, Bray, because Andrew Sparks, out of California, he beat Peyton Robb last week. He was down 6-1, I believe, to Jake Tucker of Michigan State and just gets a reversal, claws his way back, gets some takedowns, and ends up winning that match late against a really solid Tucker and you know Minnesota we were looking at their lineup like man maybe a rough year Andrew Sparks could be a real bright stop, spot to go along with Brayton Lee and Pat McKee and Gable Stevenson. yeah 
Yeah, that's. I mean, that's one of those things. I mean, we talked about Missouri's lineup earlier, and and they're a team that you, they didn't you didn't really know what they had in some of these starters, guys like guys like Hart, got you know guys that are now coming along and they could score big points. And Minnesota is a team that needed that, right? I mean, they they didn't they had a couple guys that that were going to be definite point scorers, but they needed a few more to step up if they're going to start to get themselves back in that kind of national conversation and I don't know that they'd be a trophy team this year it doesn't seem like it but but if they're going to build into that kind of a team in the next couple of years they need somebody like Sparks to to do that and he was a late pickup for them um mm-hmm. and already making a big impact so so it's really you know really good good work from him yes um and we didn't even talk about the uh this is a great man it's such a eventful week slash weekend in wrestling but Illinois beats Ohio State that was Got to be the biggest upset of the week. Yes. Um, and yeah. it wasn't like – sometimes you get you get dual upsets and you're like, well, it wasn't actually that bad because, you know, there's weird matchup things happen in duels. They just they just lost matches that you thought they'd win. D'Amelio lost. Luffman beat uh, Orndorff. Uh, Orndorff went 0-2 on the weekend, I think. Luffman beat Hilger and Orndorff. Yes. In the same day. So – this guy, I mean, where the freak is gas tank Gary? He beat Luffman eleven to four last year. You can't pound on the table hard enough because this is, Gary needs a shot. I think I think well, it's they and Ohio State's got to send a shot across the bow. These starters, right? They get and t- Coach Ryan, I think, even tweeted like, "Listen, our lineup's not set. We don't know who our guys are going to be." Etchemendia got a match after Demilio lost. Demilio won the wrestle off, of course, uh, but. Etchemenia get he got a win, so I don't know, man. Uh, when you think yeah. about that. Go ahead, Brian. Think about that duel, and and Illinois started out by by giving up an upset, right? Malik Heinzelman was ranked behind Justin Cardani, and and Malik gets the upset, and so it's like, oh man, Ohio State training in the right direction. Like Illinois probably not going to win this early, and I mean they just look great throughout. So um, hats off to them. They're undefeated, and when they when they wrestled Indiana last week, I know that's obviously a very different team, but the way they were attacking and the bonus points they were putting up, um, just the way they were finishing matches, it looked like a team that was pretty dialed in, and uh, so I think they're going to be a team that's going to be really really fun to watch this year. For sure. I mean, Lucas Bird beats Jordan Decatur uh, 2-0, and you kind of, I didn't watch, I didn't get to watch that match, but you can kind of Figure how that 2-0 happens. Decatur just struggles on the mat. He can't mm-hmm. hold guys down, and he can't get away. That is going to make college wrestling really, really tough. Um, Danny Pusino beats Dylan D'Amelio 12-7. Yeah, it was, um, I saw highlights of the match. D'Amelio was in control, and it was a big, like, I think a six-point move in the third period. Um, I don't even know what to call it. It's almost like a little head pinch type thing. D'Amelio was in on the leg, and he mm-hmm. just kind of head pinched him between his legs. And had that arm across. Oh yeah! And caught him on his back for the two points and the danger near fall. Um, so yeah, but a huge win. It's Sammy Sasso though, he yeah, decked my car. That's that's notable. Yeah. So Sasso, you know, while Ohio State did not have a great performance, Sasso is clearly right there, uh, clicking. Bronigal beats Ethan Smith. I probably would not have predicted that. I probably would have picked Smith. Smith had a really solid season last year at sixty-five. Carson Karchla is out for the year with mm-hmm. the knee injury. That is obviously a sucks. Ma- that sucks. Massive blow to Ohio State. I mean, we saw that guy at RTC Cup. He, frankly, handled Makai Lewis. You can call it freestyle, folk style, whatever. He handled Makai Lewis in basically a neutral wrestling contest, and that's he. That puts you on a, on a tier, right? And so to lose that, and as good as Ethan Smith is, I think we all know he's not. He's not Carson Carson level. Um, and then Zach Bronicle beats Rocky Jordan. Of course, we had the Rankers Delight there with Weiler, Bronicle, and Jordan. Uh, Robluski beats Gavin Hoffman. So it's like, do you get Chase Singletary out there knowing that, um, you know, Hoffman won the wrestle off? But if you're losing to the Robluskis, maybe yeah, yeah. maybe you're not. You got to. You got to go ahead out there. And then, listen, we said it since the transfer was announced. And this makes us sound like we're anti- Tate Orndorff. We are not. We're not. He's great. He's good. But he's not GTG. <laughs> he's not GTG. And that's that's what the people need. 
That's what the Cavelli Center needs, and frankly, it might be what the Ohio State wrestling team needs. And I know you went all this trouble to recruit this guy and get the transfer in, and you didn't need to. You had the guy. You had the guy. It's kind of, yeah. A tale as old as time. The grass is always greener. The heavyweight's always bigger on the other side, but you never know. There's that heart and soul element of Ohio's own Gary Traub, and I don't know. Maybe you go with him. Maybe Orndorff won the wrestle off technically, and maybe we want to honor that. But at the same time, he Gas Tank Gary didn't get Luffman, okay, and and Tate Orndorff did. So not a great so performance. Did Hilder. Yeah, I know. And maybe the, the 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 main story is Illinois. And you you mentioned Bray the Indiana win where they looked really good. I think at this level and and. You know what we've seen with Indiana is they're they're on their way, right? Even though they were favored to win, when you see that kind of separation, I think that is notable. I think that is like okay, it's, something's going on here with with Illinois. They're looking good, and to follow it up with what they did against Ohio State, which has to be one of the biggest wins in the last couple of years for Illinois. I mean, a signature win where they were not favored to to win this duel. I would not have predicted them to win this duel. No, and. They, they won, and they won some tough matches where they were not favored to win. So, great job. I think Missouri beat Iowa State 31-7. to Holy cow. They, yeah. And they're Iowa's, kicking people's necks in. They're kicking people's necks in. Iowa State has, like, a lineup full of seven. I think when everyone's in their lineup, it's, like, seven ranked guys. But even when they don't, like, Cam Ro- like Dagan hasn't wrestled a match this year. Uh-oh. Cam Robinson's been amazing. Uh, at 33, Zach Redding has been really good as a replacement for for Austin Gomez. I know he's no no Gomez, but he's yeah. still been good. And uh, younger, the Cuban had a one point match with Rocky Elam. Yeah, um, he's really good. That is a lineup that is solid from top to bottom, and they kicked the crap out of them. Their whole neck. <laughs> but G, our boy G Grimm, he took out Elam. Yes. that's a nice win. Mm-hmm. Man, I'm I feel so deprived of. Uh, by not getting to see Carr versus O'Toole at 157. I want to see that match so bad. <laughs> David Carr beat the mess out of Jared JQs, which maybe tells us all we need to know. But still, in my heart of hearts, I feel like that would be a really exciting, compelling match. Uh, but Keegan Keegan won by fall over Grant Stotts uh, in that match. And, yeah, so very, very notable, exciting. we got to get to some questions, I guess, here shortly before we – Get the heck out of here. I guess we'll talk about more. A lot of stuff happening. Yeah, a lot of stuff's happening. Let's get to some questions. Anything before we uh, transition there, David? Let's hit it. Let's hit it. Okay. First question is, um, oh, great question, uh, Jeremiah Butteris. Any chance of Askren versus Ludke on the next uh, flow card? We should look into that. You know, Ben wants to get back. He wants to do a match at some point. And he wants it not to be against someone like, you know, like Nate Jackson level. He wants someone, you know, he can beat. He calls them bums. I will not call them bums because we are literally talking about all-American level wrestlers. But he wants to pin some bums before he comes out. Let's run it back with Ludke. I'm here for Askren it. Versus, Ask, Askren versus Ludke, Bradkey versus Budkey. <laughs> Co-main event, I Josh think. Budkey's going down. <laughs> oh, man. Josh Budkey, you've been called out. Listen, Bracky watched, watched the documentary. I did. I was a kid. I was like, dang, this is intense. <laughs> Dude, that was so intense. If you don't, uh, what was the name of that? It was an Iowa ESPN documentary. It was like on yeah. the mat or something. Yeah. A season, on the, the, a season on the mat. Yeah. No, that's the name of the, the book. book. Oh, whoops. Right? Yeah. That's the book. Yeah. I, I thought that's right. what they called it too, though. Man, they just. Straight ripped it. It's just called ESPN this, the season, Iowa wrestling. The season. Okay. Mako's in there. Bucky's this guy fighting for the starting job. And anyways, uh, Bucky versus Bracky, Lucky versus Ashley. <laughs> Let's make it happen. Um, how about the Oklahoma State trio of true freshmen? Asks David Wilco. Yeah, you got to be super fired up. I mean, obviously, and he's referring to AJ Ferrari, Dustin Plot, and Trevor. Master Giovanni, you want to see them against better competition, but uh, hey, I'm, I'm arguing with some dude on Twitter yeah. right now. Please do. <laughs> he just no, he just wants AJ Ferrari ranked top ten because he's like, well, you guys know he's top ten. 
No, we don't. I, I, I mean, I guess maybe, but do we? He's re- wrestled four matches, two of them. Uh, the guys don't have winning records in their collegiate careers. I mean, we think he's very good. We have no idea where he stacks up against the top 25. We think he's going to be up there and in the top 10. Well, we can't just put people in there. Can't just do it. Master is the only one in the rankings right now because he's the only one that has a ranked win. Uh, Plot has wrestled not good competition as well. And Fry will get his first uh, ranked matchup this weekend. I think he sees uh, Jacob Seeley from Northern Colorado. And Plot can see uh, Jackson Hemauer. So... They win those matches, they get in, it takes care of itself. I mean, we do this every single year. Does, does Oklahoma State wrestle West Virginia this year? Yes, they're they're in this Cowboy Challenge Tournament on the 14th. I love Challenge Tournaments. Um, that'll be and, a good and, one. Uh, Mastro is going to have Theorius Robeson this weekend, so that that yes. ma- and that match is on yeah. flow. That's going to be a really fun duel. Um, <clears throat> I I really like that that the, you know the idea of that matchup. Um, Master and Theorius could be really fun, but I, we're going to learn a lot more about these freshmen as they continue, to, uh, continue yeah. to get more matches. Yeah, I mean, listen, rankings and our own personal perceptions are very can be very different, and we're very high on all three. I'm, I'm, Mastro is the one that's ranked, but I'm probably higher on the correct on Plot and Ferrari for what I think they can do in NCAA wise. But then again, with Mastro, it's like, what have we said about 125? Literally anyone. Mm-hmm. It could be Bracky. It could be Mastro that wrestles Spencer Lee in the finals. So you can be pretty excited about that. But I think Ferrari and Plot are, are potential superstar level guys. And yeah, uh, you should be very excited that you're going to get five years of those three guys, uh, barring health and all other things, that you could potentially wrestle, watch those guys wrestle for five years. Um, jazz legend Roy Donk. When does the Keegan O'Toole or Tanner Sloan Hod Trophy talk start? It starts right now, today. They're in the mix, as are all the other undefeated guys that have bonus wins. Luke Luffman Alan in Hart. the mix. Alan Hart in the mix. Nelson Brands in the mix. Um, so, yeah, the Hodge, the Hodge walk, watch is uh, very extensive. But, yeah, if, if I'll say this. If Tanner Sloan continues to bonus at this rate, he will win the Hodge well, Trophy. If he bonuses everyone. Yes, but, uh, you know, it has a way of whittling itself down. People are re- – wrestling minds that are not me or anyone in this room or Ben Askren are so high on Keegan O'Toole. The, a coach hit me up and said, this is, this is like one of the – skill for skill, one of the best wrestlers in the country, Keegan O'Toole. Like that's how he's being wow. regarded. So that's not me. That's uh, actual professionals. What place does Illinois finish in the Big Ten? Hmm. Good question. They feel like a team where if if you look at like didn't Nebraska finish second last year at uh at Big Ten? So they like had an I amazing so. tournament. So like the, the I don't think I'm not saying they're they can get second, but Nebraska benefited from just having ten really good wrestlers that all Dang. wrestled well and, and placed. Um I could see them do we have an updated Big Ten rankings? Yeah, here we go. Let me see where they're ranked currently because they're sure to move up after this performance. We don't have team rankings for Big Ten? J.D. Raider. I believe he did these before all all tournament rankings. I was going to say, I think he did these before Big Ten duels wrestled, and they have not been updated. Dang it. All right, we got to add uh, team rankings. I mean, they they can't finish second. No. I think they could be top four or five, though, potentially. They're not beating Iowa, Penn State. Michigan. Michigan, probably not Nebraska. No. But beyond that, I think I think they could be let's say top five or six, which would be a great a great showing. And a lot of things would have to go right. I'm excited to see how good Lucas Bird wrestles this year. Uh he was a solid guy out of Ohio. Mm-hmm. Was originally going to Maryland. Yes, I believe so. And then he didn't uh with the coaching change there and ended up going to Illinois. So excited to watch him. He beat Decatur, and uh, his challenges will only increase as, as time goes. Uh, next question. Mm. Which team is the biggest surprise through the first three weeks of the season? Is it Missouri? Because maybe it's Missouri. It may be. 
It's, it's maybe Illinois, I mean, though. Illinois, too. It, yeah, it's I Illinois, Illinois for me. Because, like, I could... Well, one, Alan Hart is a huge surprise for me. But the other guys wrestling well are not... I'm not, like, blown away. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Illinois, so far, you know, there's a two-week-long season right now with not many matches. I think it, I think it would probably be Illinois. They've surprised me the most. Yeah, and I mean, just the way they've they've wrestled and competed from top to bottom in that lineup has been has been, yeah, it's made them such a fun team to watch. Where the last couple of years, you think about Illinois, I mean, I think you think about a lot of really good, solid wrestlers, but you don't think about pace and scoring a ton of points and um, big upsets. Whereas this is a team that feels like they can do that, and and that's uh, that's really that's a fun team to to watch every time they're out. So I, that that has been a surprise to me, and really welcome one. Uh, Tanner McHugh, what NCAA team has the highest chance of having one champ but no other All American this year? I would say that would be UNC, um, North Carolina. Like Austin O'Connor could definitely win, mm-hmm. and uh, there's definitely a scenario where no other guys place for UNC. Um, don't know. If I'm looking. Trying to think of his other. Oh no, uh, West Virginia. Yeah. Noah Adams would be one. Yep. One that may surprise Rutgers. Mm-hmm. Like Seabass could win, and no one else could play if Seriano doesn't come back. Yeah. If if. Well, I guess Alvarez, but he didn't wrestle in their first duel either. So I don't know what's going on. This, this freaking stinks. <laughs> what <laughs> this this season? Yeah, it's kind of stinky, but it's happening. No, Things- I'm not. Yeah. It's just guys aren't in the lineups. You don't know what it is. You don't know if it's COVID related. You don't know if it's injury related. You know, you don't just know if they're like, not wrestling. Right. It's just it's tough to figure out what's going on. Yep. So, um, what was I gonna say? I forget. Dag on it. It'll come back to me at an inopportune time. Um. Next question. After watching the Hank, this is from an actual cannibal. So. You know, but we don't judge here. Uh, after watching the Hank DeGlain and all the pro cards this year, it looks pretty obvious American wrestlers have become much more proficient at parterre offense. What's left for Americans to work on to take it to the next level in international competition? Edge wrestling, uh, he, he asked. I think that's obviously an area we can improve. We have some guys that are really, like Jordan Burroughs is transformatively good on the edge. She's um, you know, one of the best edge wrestlers in the world. I just think in, we're just not good at in, closing out matches in general. I think it's a it's a tough spot. I just like protecting those late leads when it's when we're only up by one or two and a one or two beats us. We're not great there. I don't know how you get. Obviously, I don't know how to do anything, but like that's a that's more of a tougher adjustment because like whereas edge wrestling, there's like there's technical adjustments. Whereas I feel like the end of match tactics are more maybe mindset than just simple tactics, right? It's like your approach. Do you try to score or what do you do? I think it's a little tougher to close out matches. Whereas like in folk style, listen, one thing that makes freestyle great is like those leads are a lot harder to protect when you're up one or two. And in folk style, it's just so much harder to get points. Takedowns are harder to get. There's no step out. So it's easier to be up one and just like sit on your lead, right? You haven't been warned. You can run, whereas if you start running it around a freestyle mat, you can give give up a step out. There's a variety of things. So I think it's just making that adjustment from folk style to freestyle in the end of match tactics that, for me, I think is a, a big step we can take forward. I agree. I mean, if you think about this weekend, and there are two prominent instances. We already talked about the one with Gilman. The other is the the match with Zahid Valencia. Um, I can't remember which Russian he was wrestling. Really tough, uh, a Eurekan champ. Um, and he's, he's in that match late. He's winning ends up, you know, giving up a, a step out and then, and then challenges to end up giving up criteria lead. And then, and then he was in on a shot and got, got turned, uh, just exposed. And, and that it was, it was exactly that it was tactical. It was clear that he had the offensive weapons. He had like the attacking mindset, but he didn't have those end of match tactics. And, and like Gilman that ended up kind of being the difference in the match. Yes, um, I agree with that. Um, last question, because it's 946. Sorry. Um, does Henry DeGlain affect Olympic trial seeds? If so, what's the updated predictions on them now? Well, one, we should do updated seeding pred- 
predictions because, two, I believe these will impact trial seeds, and I believe that they should. Um, you know, there's that's been a question, like, does the Gross-Gilman uh, Wisconsin thing, does that have a, a, a seeding impact? Will the, I think a UWW event, absolutely should should have some precedent and that really could change things up because Soriano was a guy where if they had had the trials in March or in April it would have been a different story but now that he's got to add this he should theoretically pass both Gilman and Vito for outplacing him at the this tournament but I don't know if that will how that will factor in the criteria but whereas we were thinking hey maybe it's going to be Spencer and Soriano and maybe even Dayton all on the same side with Gilman at the one, this could totally shift it up and around and in a way I'm not sure because as as we remember, while Dayton made the team, Gilman beat him at built Gilman beat Dayton at Pelicone, and then Spencer won senior nationals. So how does that but with this happening at the Deglane, I think it shifts it shifts it around a little bit more and I don't know how it's gonna shake out. I asked Terry Steiner about this yesterday. I was like, hey, should the DeGlane matches Name count? Job. Should other matches count? And he said, Terry Steiner said, if it's a wrestling match, it should count. So I, I agree. Well, if it's a wrestling match. Amen. Well, it was a wrestling match. Uh, and one, one thing to know, um, women's and men's and Greco, all three have kind of slightly different variations for how they pick their team. I don't know if that uh, trickles down into seeding or not, but they have different – um, sort of trials pro- processes, which is which is notable. So with that, I think it's time to go. It's nine forty eight. We uh we went a couple minutes into OT. Uh, we don't have criteria here on FRL. Um, thank you guys so much for listening. Tomorrow will be episode six hundred. How about that? We won't do anything special uh, because we don't ever. We may raise the roof. Uh, raise the rough raise the rough but beyond that that's all we're gonna do we're just gonna have a show ben will be back allegedly uh i believe johnny ruggiano is gonna come on to talk about the captain's cup for a little bit so a lot going on it's wrestling season baby fun times thanks so much for listening thanks for watching thanks for um keeping the lights on here we appreciate it see you tomorrow goodbye